you'd have to throw it at me. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for that song service, Tyler. Amen. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 8, we're going to have our scripture reading by AJ, uh, one of our graduates we're celebrating today. So um, if you'll turn to that scripture, we'll be looking at 8 through our lesson today. Acts chapter 8. Morning. 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 Therefore, those who had been scattered went through places preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. I'm not sure how many of you are really familiar with the song, Throw Out the Lifeline. So it's a song we sang a lot in college, uh, but I haven't heard it a whole lot, but I did ask Tyler if he would lead that for us for our invitation today. So um, I just kind of want you to think about that concept today. Um, as we're continuing our sermon series, Revive Us Again, what is revival? So I started the series talking about spiritual revival. It refers to a spiritual reawakening, kind of a wake up call from a state of dormancy or even stagnation in the life of a believer. It's easy to get stagnant sometimes or dormant and forget why we do what we do or even forget to do what we should be doing because it's just kind of easy to get in a rut. And so I think we have these wake up calls in scripture and sometimes just seeing it thinks, oh, I should be doing that is what I find when I'm opening my word, opening God's word. So looking at that song, Throw Out the Lifeline, I've been trying to kind of tell the story behind some of these songs to give the songs even kind of greater meaning for us. So this was written in 1888 by Edward Hufford. He lived in the remote hamlet of Westwood about a dozen miles from Boston. He was a young minister and was active in holding open air evangelistic tent services. And as he was doing that, and as he was hearing the gospel songs, he says that he was just motivated thinking, I should write a song about how important it is to seek and save the lost. And so he was sitting at his home in a little village, not very far from the sea. And he said, not far from my home, I could see at low water the remainings of an old wreck that was embedded in the sand. As I was walking along the shore, he wrote, my, amation, my imagination strove to picture what the storm did on that fateful night when it tossed this craft into the seashore. And as he was picturing this kind of carcass of a ship that was beaten and hit by the waves, as he was walking, he says, what about the people that were on that ship? I wonder what hope they had, were they able to get in the lifeboat? Were they able to survive? What happened to them as their craft that they were trusting in was tossed to the shore? He said, as my heart was yearning for an effective message, a thought came to me. Why not have a specific service out in a tent here on the beach so I can warn everyone of their danger if they were lost. And as he was thinking about that, he said, I sat down and within 15 minutes, I wrote the song, Throw Out the Lifeline, that I wanted to have sung at this open air tent meeting on Sunday next to this ship. So I could say, our job is to throw out the lifeline. Thought that was fascinating. So if you want to turn to 633, I just wanted to read, I'm not going to sing it, I promise, so you'll have to start headed for the doors. Um, I want to read the third verse, because honestly, as I was preparing this lesson, and as I was looking at the lyrics, the third verse really hit me. It said, he wrote, soon the season 
of rescue will be over. Soon will they drift to eternity's shore. Haste then, my brother, there's no time for delay, but throw out the lifeline and save them today. Throw out the lifeline, someone's drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, someone's sinking today. And as I was thinking about that concept, started thinking about my coworkers and my family members and my cousins that grew up in my house and the different people that I know are not children of God and have not given their life in obedience. And it's my job to do anything I can to throw out the lifeline. They have to choose to accept it, but it's a responsibility of mine, a privilege of mine to try to do some effort to provide rescue. With that said, what kind of church are we? Are we a church that's motivated to throw out the lifeline? So I did a sermon years ago and I recycled some of it for this lesson because it still com comes to my mind when I think about this concept. Are we a lifeboat church? Many of you are familiar with the story from the Titanic of how unexpectedly all those people were being lost and there were the lifeboats that were barely filled that were sent away from the ship. And as hundreds were in the water, it says it plunged 12,000 feet to the bottom of the, of the Atlantic. 20 lifeboats that launched away from the sinking ship were all only partially filled. But out of all of those boats, did you know they heard the screams and only one lifeboat left the other 20 and came back to find the people to rescue. <clears throat> Out of 20 boats, boat 14 went back and said, this isn't right. We have all this room left in this boat. We need to find anyone we can to get them to be saved. They were a lifeboat church, weren't they? <laughs> Their mission was, we're not going to be satisfied with just saving ourselves. We have to do everything we can to rescue those give them any hope. Only lifeboat 14 rode back as a ship shame, as the ship sank at 2.20 a.m. Alone, it was darting after remaining voices in the darkness, but they were only able to save a precious few. What irony. A lifeboat that failed to save lives. A parallel irony is a church hmm. that's begged to reach out for the few stragglers still in the sea, mm -hmm. but we like the safety and security of our own ship. Hmm. We just like to be comfortable. And so we don't throw out the lifeline because we want to make sure we stay saved. There's a lot of stuff about why those other boats didn't go back. They put themselves at risk. They could have been overcome by all the other people that were desperate to survive and they could have gotten in the boat, overloaded it, and it could have sank. And there's all these kind of speculation as to, you know, they were just smart and staying back and making sure they didn't put themselves in danger. And I'm afraid sometimes we are just comfortable being comfortable. Yeah. When there's people within a mile of this church that are struggling, within a hundred yards of this church that are struggling. And we need to be the ones that they know care. And that we are letting nothing stop us from sharing. Yes. As this quote says, the church used to be a lifeboat rescuing the perishing. Now she's a cruise ship recruiting the promising. Mm. It's kind of thought provoking, isn't it? 
have we become a lifeboat church in a cruise ship world where we see nothing but the salvation of others as our primary important goal? Acts 8, I think, should serve to convict us. This is what the New Testament church made their passion was to always teach the word, to do everything they can to reach the lost because they didn't want anyone to be lost without knowing the message. A lot of people wouldn't accept it, but they had to share it. So let's look at some of those verses. It was a central focus of the whole book of Acts, actions of the early apostles. But specifically in chapter eight, if you want to look at it, starting, let's look at Acts eight, four, which he read for us a few minutes ago. Those who were scattered went about doing what? Preaching the word. Everywhere they went, they were preaching the word. Verse five, Philip, as he went down the city of Samaria, proclaimed to them Christ. Then in Acts 8, 12, when they believed Philip, as he was preaching what? The good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And then in Acts 8, 25, as the disciples, they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord. They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. They were sharing with everyone, going across party lines to do it. Then Acts 8, 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. That's to the Ethiopian eunuch. What are we doing? Yeah. You know, they used a natural style of mission. You know, areas were not targeted. Surveys were not taken. Christians weren't horse whipped with guilt. It says in Acts 8 4, as they were scattered, they went about preaching the word. They took this and shared it because they were excited about the message of Christ and his sacrifice. The good news, they literally thought was good news to the point they had to share it with everyone. They didn't go out and decide, you know, this would be the best community for us to reach out to. They just, everywhere they were, shared the message. So if they went to Olive Garden, what were they doing? Sharing the message. So if they went and did a walk in their neighborhood, what were they doing? Sharing the message. So if they went to the Thurston County Fairgrounds, what were they doing? Sharing the message of the good news everywhere they went. We share not because we're commanded to, though we are commanded to. But Jeremiah, I think, is a huge example for us. If we think about his preaching style, read in Jeremiah 20, verse 9. If I say I'm not going to mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can't. And you know what? Jeremiah is the one who preached for 40 years and nobody listened to him. That's a sad state for a preacher, isn't it? Nobody listened. That's why he was the weeping prophet. But what did he keep doing? He kept sharing because it was like a fire in his bones. He just couldn't hold in. Is that how the gospel, the good news is to you? that you can't hold it in because you know there are lost who have not accepted Christ and become baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. 
It's like Penn and Teller. I know I did a sermon a couple years ago, but the big guy, I don't remember if he's Penn or Teller, but he said, I'm a proud atheist, but about those Christians, how much do they have to hate me to not share the message? If they truly believe there's a judgment day, and if I don't know the truth, I'm going to die and go to hell. How much do they have to hate me to wish that on me? And I just thought, whoa, <laughs> is that the way they think? That if I truly believe in this, I have to talk about it. They not only use the natural mission style, but they had passion as they did it. And I'm just going to be blunt with you. Having an I love you Jesus sticker on the back, of, I mean, I love Jesus sticker on the bumper of your car isn't going to result in someone pulling over the side of the road and repenting. Yes. It's not. Yes. It's us having received the word and being so impressed with it what Christ did for us, we have to share it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having a I Love Jesus bumper sticker, but we can't rely on that to save the world. We've got to share. And how do we share? Psalm 126, five and six, I think is probably my favorite evangelism text. It says, those who sow in tears why would you sow in tears? Because you're so motivated that they are lost without this message that it brings tears to your eyes. It says those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, burying the seed for sowing, will come back home with shouts of joy as he's bringing in the sheaves. It's exciting when you share the message and it's received, isn't it? Yeah. We have been so blessed the next few years, the last next few years, the last few <laughs> weeks, as we've had new brothers and sisters in Christ added to the church. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. I'm looking at them out in the crowd and I just have a smile on my face <laughs> thinking we have people that have accepted the message and are excited to be Christians. Is that motivating you to share the message? to throw out the lifeline. They had a central message, as we find. First, in Acts 8, 4, what did they share? The Word. God's Word is what they shared. In Acts 8, 5, what did they share? Christ, who He is and what He had done. Acts 8, 12, what did they share? The good news of the kingdom of God. Acts 8, 25, what did they share? Again, the word of the Lord. It was a central message, right? Can you see a pattern here? And last, Acts 8, 35, again, they shared the good news about Jesus. They had a common theme, huh? It wasn't come to my church because you've got a great preacher. That, that wasn't their message. It wasn't come to my church because we have great potlucks. It was come to my church and worship with us because we worship a savior that we can't even imagine not having in our life. We have a savior who gave himself because of his immense love for us. We have a God who shows us his love throughout all of his word. That was our central message. From the day of Pentecost on, it says the early church were telling people the story of salvation. In Luke 24, 46, it says, thus it is written, Christ will suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. That was their message. They kept at the heart of the message. Philip, who's mentioned in several of our texts here, like the others, shared the message of sacrifice. It says like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before his shearer was silent, so he opened not his mouth. As Philip was sharing, who was he talking about? Christ, and what he had done. 
that changed Philip's life and would change everyone Philip was talking to. We have a lifeline and it doesn't look like a little white circle. It's the message of Christ and how much he's done. We must share because he paid way too high a price for our salvation, for us to keep it to ourselves in our self-made life boats. Mm. Mm. It is sad if we just worry about ourselves. It is sad if we make Christianity about us because it's always about him. Mm. It's always about what he's done for us so we can share it with others. If you are a person here today, hopefully all of you are, I didn't think about how that would come out. You're all people. But if you are here today and you have not accepted the gift of Christ, the lifeline is thrown. Respond to what he's done for you. Put on Christ in baptism. Confess him as Lord. Repent of your sins. And you have a home waiting for you in heaven. That's a message worth sharing, isn't it? You have the life-saving message, but what are you doing with it? You need to wake up and start sharing the good news today to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, to strangers. Everywhere they went, they shared the word. They preached the message. As we're doing each week, we're closing with this verse, Ephesians 5, 14. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The way he shines on us is us reflecting him to the world. May we hear more clearly the cries from the darkness, like boat 14 did. They were motivated to go rescue the perishing because they heard the cries and knew if we don't go, they're lost. And that motivated them to put their lives at risk when the other 19 boats wouldn't. Are we a lifeboat church? You have the lifeboat message, the life-saving message. Throw out the lifeline. Rescue the perishing. We are going to throw out that lifeline now as we sing the song, Throw Out the Lifeline. If you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've not been living the way you should and you need the prayers of this congregation, we want to pray for you. If you're not motivated to share the message, please evaluate your life and what's keeping you from sharing the good news. If you need to respond, please do so as we stand and have our invitation song. Throw out the lifeline across the dark way. There is a brother who someone should say. Somebody's brother or then will dare to throw out the lifeline his peril to share. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is drifting away. Throw Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is sinking today.